I'm Mandy Limiak, and I want to tell you a little bit about the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering today, specifically Environmental and Natural Resource Engineering, um, or ENRE. So when most people are out in nature, they see wetlands, they see drainage ditches, and they just see that there are plants and water there. They don't really consider how the design of those spaces actively help our environment. And that's where ENRE comes in. We design engineering projects, ecosystems that use natural resources like soil, water, plants, and that helps reduce ecosystem pollution in ways to help us all. Without systems like this, without these engineering designs, we can face these global threats of algae blooms, erosion, climate change. So I want to introduce you a little bit to the idea of environmental engineering and some of the concepts that we work with today in a more hands-on fashion. So now we're gonna do a little hands-on activity, again, with things you have at home, um, to show you some of the difficulties in engineering and environmental science that involve groundwater and groundwater contamination. So groundwater is all of the water <laughs> that's underground. Um, the way it works is surface water, um, rainfall, anything like that can percolate through the ground or work its way down through the soil, through the rocks, through the clay, and creates this water table. A lot of people, we're lucky, we live in Indiana, we have a very high water table, and a lot of people are able to even draw their drinking water for their houses right from a well. Um, that is drawing groundwater out. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. As you can see in this graph, only 2% of the world's water is actually fresh water, but 12% of that 2% is groundwater. So significantly more groundwater than the water you can see in rivers and lakes. And the way this cycle works, if you follow some of these arrows, you've got water running, coming down in the form of snow or rain. It melts off the ice caps of mountains. It forms streams and rivers, goes to lakes, ponds. Some of it follows these down arrows into the groundwater. Some of it follows the side arrows over towards the ocean. Anytime it's hot and sunny out, the water is evaporating, which leads to more clouds and then eventually more rain. And it's a nice circle like that where we're reusing water all the time, but that's partly why taking care of contamination is so important. So now looking at groundwater specifically, we've got rainfall coming down and you can see water enters the ground, it enters the stream and it can take days to get to your well if it's fairly shallow and close to your well. It could potentially take years. But then we've got these layers here of clay that form what we call a confining bed, a confining layer. That means the water can't move through very quickly. It's a really slow process. That's what gets us to these confined aquifers. This water can be, can take centuries to get down here or to come back up to the surface. And if you have two confining beds and a, another aquifer below it, then we're talking millennia, thousands and thousands of years. So groundwater is really important and it moves in such a different ways. Some of it can move so quickly straight into the stream, just barely below the surface. But then some of it takes so long to ever reach back to us again. But the tricky part is that you can't see it and you can't be sure what's happening. So when contamination occurs, Oftentimes what we find are some common places that it can happen. Coal mines, road salt, pesticides and fertilizers can make their way down. Um, gas stations, buried tanks, like buried gas tanks, buried septic tanks if it leaks, um, landfills, all that kind of thing can eventually, if it gets spilled, come down into our groundwater. Sometimes it can be down, like we said, in days. It could reach your well. Um, sometimes it may take 
centuries to clear it out because it's way down below in that confined aquifer. So as you can see, these poor people are not very happy. Their soil has been contaminated and it has reached down into their aquifer where it's worked its way over to this person's well. So what we're going to do today is demonstrate that in a slightly more fun fashion with some things you have around your house. So when contamination happens, how do we figure out where it is? How do we figure out how to fix it? There's a couple things we do. Oftentimes we know a spill has occurred and so we'll put in wells. And these wells, we call them monitoring wells. They're not the same kind of well as what you have pumping water at your house, if you have well water at your house. Um, they're a little bit smaller and they don't continuously pump, but we can pump water out of them to test the water at the depth where the well has been dug to. So you can see there are some really deep wells here, almost to the bedrock. We don't want it to cross the bedrock if we can help it because then we know we're getting into that confined aquifer. And we're able to see where and how the plume, which is what we call the contaminated area, is traveling. So we follow the wells, we follow the contamination through the wells, and then we come up with a plan for remediation based on where it's moving and how fast it's moving and how big it's growing. Um, so what we're going to do today is do a little experiment with groundwater, confined and unconfined aquifers, and monitoring wells. While we can learn a lot from looking at pictures, it's a lot more fun when we can see it in person and be hands-on about it, right? So we're going to build our own aquifer today, and we're going to test what it looks like when the groundwater is contaminated and then we drill a well in, okay? So... All you need are some household things you probably already have in your house. And I'm gonna use cup. I like using clear because then I can see a little better what I'm doing, but it's not required. It does make it a little easier. You need something crushed. I'm gonna use crushed ice, just the kind you crush right out of your freezer. Um, if your freezer doesn't have that option, you can fill a bag and hit it with a rolling pin um, or you can use something else crushed, crushed cookies or gummy bears are an option. I'm going to use ice because then mine will turn out being sort of like an ice cream float at the end. Um, I've got some dirt. I've got light brown dirt. I've got dark brown dirt. I just crushed up some graham crackers and some Oreos. And I've got some big pieces of organic matter in the form of chocolate sprinkles. Um, the other thing you need is a little bit of ice cream of some kind. I'm going to use this Italian ice sherbet style ice cream. You use regular ice cream, you can use vanilla, chocolate, you can use sherbet, whatever you want. As long as it's frozen and we can make a clean layer with it is all that matters. And then I've got clear soda. So I'm going to use Sprite. Any of the clear sodas will work. And a little bit of food coloring and a straw. That's all you need. All stuff you hopefully already have in your house, but could easily grab one or two extra ingredients the next time mom or dad is going to the store. So we're gonna start by putting some crushed ice in our cup. Okay. So this is gonna be my confined aquifer. There, the ground is full of gravel, rocks, soil, sand, all those things, right? So this ice is gonna represent those things that the water sits in and around. Our soda is gonna be my water and my aquifer. Now you wanna fill it just enough to be to the top of the ice, not too far over, okay? So pour carefully. That's gonna be important. Then we're going to make a confined layer, a confining layer. We talked about how there's bedrock and there's clay in the ground and these can form a confining layer. So we're gonna use our ice cream as our confining layer and go ahead and make it nice and thick, but make sure, use your spoon to spread it all around so that make sure you can get all the way to the edges and you've created a barrier. So we wanna make sure we've got a water barrier here. And if it doesn't work, no big deal, you just try again just means 
more floats for you. But we are gonna try to get this one right. So, I think I just need a little bit more. Okay, so now I've got my confining layer. So this is a layer of bedrock or clay or something that keeps the water from passing easily. Where we talked about how it might take more like centuries to get below this layer from the surface. So above that layer, we have more ground. So more crushed ice. There we go. Okay, so we've got this nice big ground layer. Our aquifer here is gonna be where we would pull our drinking water out of potentially. So on top of our typical bed of soil and rock and gravel, we have a little bit of the kind of soil that you would be able to dig up in your backyard. We've got light colored first. And then I've got darker colored to represent organic matter. So organic matter is all the things that were once living, like plants, grasses, crops, that have now died. They become organic matter, which is like food for everything else. So then I'll throw in a few sprinkles on top as our chunks of organic matter and plants and anything else on the surface. Okay. Then, unfortunately, we have now had a contamination spill. Our water looks like this. Okay. Not ideal. But it spills and it fills our surface aquifer. If you're like me, you should do this outside so you don't make too much mess in your house. As you can see though, we've had our spill, but it's staying above that confining layer. So the good news is the confining layer is doing its job. It's keeping it out of the aquifer, but it does have slow leaks. It can get in there eventually. Now what happens when you dig a well? All right, I dug a well into our groundwater. First thing, do you notice there's some now contamination has reached down in? What happens if I drink from our aquifer? What if I'm pulling up well water at my house? It's now pulling more and more of the contamination down, right? So we've seen what can happen when you draw well water out. It creates pressure that helps pull more water down into it. But if that water is contaminated, it's not great. So what happens then when it rains though? Fresh, clean rain falls on the ground. Things start looking up. It's getting a little clearer up here, right? We pull more water. And it will start to pull more clear water down until eventually we can pump through our well all of our contamination plume if we've managed to keep it contained within a space or we use multiple wells along an area to pump water out and we can treat it that way then. So this is a fun little way to learn about groundwater while also getting to eat an ice cream float today.